ultimately I realised there was I wasn't really afraid of violence. I wasn't afraid of being hit or being hurt or being left or being abandoned. I was afraid of the feelings that it evoked. Okay. Um, and the feelings came from a perception. So I traced it right back to the root. If I can change the perception, I can change the reality. The moment I do something negative to you, I am my own karma because it's on my skin, it's in my cell. Mm -hmm. hundred, hundred billion cells are infused with what I did to you. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm living in a, with a violent mindset, uh, and I'm with my children, that will resonate into them. Keeps coming back, uh, talking with you, Jeff, I think, to the connections we have yeah. with people, with the universe, with, with everything inside it, and being open to the possibilities that are out there for us, embracing them, taking responsibility. Huge, yeah. Uh, to take action. Yeah rather than just sitting back and letting things happen. It, it brings me to mind of, of one of the techniques that uh, we often uh, share with some of the people we work with. Yeah. Uh, and, and a simple thing we do is, is just with body, body language. Uh, and if people practice open, relaxed body language, it makes them look more confident. And the opposite is also true if they practice closed body yeah. language then they tend to look weak they can also become sad depressed and so on but not only listening to you jeff does that open ourselves up to be becoming more confident people but it's opening up our bodies to uh, positive energies to yeah. the possibilities keeping us open to the challenges uh, and the things that we need to overcome on a day-to-day -day basis, I think. Yeah, absolutely, that's absolutely true. It's everything, everything is there already, yeah. it's already there. Everything is all around us. The, there's a word in Islam called heka, but not called heka, called um, yakim, mm. and it says the truth is undeniably right in front of you. Our potential is right there. It's obscured by the bushel of the mind, of conditioning, so we don't see it even though it's there. Mm. So the potential is right in front of us when we open ourselves up and sometimes literally like you say when we open up the chest mm. we open up all the chat all the heart chakra here we start to see our potential around us mm. um, and we start to be able to access our, and it's always been there mm -hmm. when the conscious net expands we just fall into the frequency of potentials we fall into the frequency of other people of other ideas but if we're afraid obviously everything closes down mm. and you know neurotic fear can shrink us what like it did with my brother my brother uh, a very beautiful man who died from alcoholism but he listened to neurotic fear until it shrunk him down to the size of a kitchen he ended up living in his kitchen in a tower block Gosh. and eventually I was with him when he died um, and I watched his life expire because he listened to neurotic fear um, and, I, and I wrote a film about it because it, I, I felt confused, I felt ashamed, I felt angry, I felt abandoned, mm. all of these things I didn't feel comfortable feeling. So I thought, what's my brother taught me? Mm. My brother's taught me not to listen to neurotic fear, where there's a fear, sit in it, marinate in it, dissolve it, expand. There's a fear there, sit in it, marinate in it, mm. dissolve it, expand. Um, so the biggest lesson my brother gave me through the demonstration of his life was um, do not listen to neurotic fear. Where there's a fear, you know, um, there's a treasure. Yeah. Go to it, just keep going to it. And find, if you can find the chief feature, find the thing that you're most afraid of, that's where the greatest treasure is, that's where the rich vein is. So I've done the opposite, I've just expanded. And I've, I've had points where I've not been able to do that, I've had points where I've run away from it, and I've had points where I've been sat in a pub with a cup of coffee with my wife and I'm, my eye walls breaking. Mm. Everything inside me, uh, everything inside me is wanting to run away and she's just saying, I wish I could take this away from you. Mm. And I said, I don't want you to take it away from me, but I appreciate it. And I said, cause I'm gonna go and look at this, I wanna see it. This is a leper that I need to, I need to kiss. So you go down there and you turn up and you think I'm gonna talk to 250 intellectuals today and I feel very threatened because I come from a working class background and I don't, I'm not t talking to 250 intellectuals, I'm talking to 250 beautiful people. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking to 250 
teachers, I'm talking to 250 beautiful people. I'm not talking to 40 murderers in a prison, I'm talking to 40 beautiful people. Maybe the most powerful people in the world are in that room today when I go and speak to them. When you get rid of all the labels and you change the perceptions and you think the only place to be is the place where I'm afraid, it's the only place to be. Um, and, I, and I change my perception of that. This is where the gold is, this is where I'm gonna sit. And of course my, my eye wall isn't gonna, isn't gonna um, to, uh, toughen and expand if I don't put it under more pressure. You know, the con consciousness will only expand if we um, create a necessity. Nothing, a business doesn't expand, the body doesn't, n nothing, nothing is going to change if we don't place necessity. So uh, uh, as a shamanic exercise, we can, we can hunt trauma. We can say, rather than waiting for the vicissitudes to visit us, we can go out and search for them and think, where do I feel afraid? I feel very afraid here. Then I'm going to sit in that. Mm. And then the teachers, you know, not some guy sat on a mountain in Tibet, the teacher's the girl that's lying in bed next to you. Because you're thinking, I've got to talk to her, because I'm terrified of talking to her about this issue. Yeah. Uh, or it might be your mother, I've got to talk to my mother, because I feel terrified of my mother, even mm. though I'm an adult, I'm terrified that, you know, I'm terrified of upsetting her, that she might abandon me, even as an adult. Or it might, it might be that I'm, I'm in a job, you know, that is completely below my potential. I went into a factory once recently because I was doing a TV series about uh, some factory workers and the manager showed me around. He said, oh, here's John on this machine. He said, he's a hugely intellectual guy. He says he puts a part in that end, he comes out that end and he stood like that all day. And he said, he's way below his potential. He says, but he said, if I suggest that he takes a, uh, a higher position, he gets stressed. If he suggests it to himself, he gets stressed. So we have to just watch him living be be below his means. You know, he's afraid, he is afraid of his potential. He's not even afraid of his potential, he's afraid of the feelings. Because yeah, yeah. he doesn't understand the feelings. And they said the factory's full of people that are, um, you know, most of them are living well below their potential. They could be doing much more. We've always got to encounter that. So it's, it's that feeling of where do I feel afraid? F fear is a gift, I'm gonna sit in it. That's my chief feature. Where am I terrified? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where am I really terrified? Let's go and sit in that and let's collect some treasure. If you look at the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, which is the it's a 40, 18 texts um, Hindu Bible, the 10th canto is about the birth of Krishna. Um, and it's, it talks about the fact that uh, in, the, in the time when Krishna is born, uh, there is a king called Kamsa, King Kamsa, and he's hugely threatened by the revelation that Krishna is going to be born because his kingdom is going to be threatened because Krishna is going to be sovereign. So he is similar to lots of Bible stories. He sends out, uh, he sends out uh, 12 demons to kill Krishna. Um, and every time a demon comes to kill Krishna, of course Krishna overcomes it. And he says when he overcomes the demon, the demon dies. He said the nature of the demon is liberated and the effulgence is given to Krishna. And it's basically saying that the birth of consciousness, when we become conscious of our potential, the egoic self and the egoic projections will try and attack it because mm -hmm. it feels like its life is threatened. If we can embrace these things and engage them in a non-violent war, just through observation, through non-identification, we can liberate all of our fears, the, the, uh, um, and the effulgence will come over to us and we'll ex our conscious net will expand. So, and that's what I've noticed in my own life, as my consciousness has grown, parts of me inside have, have been massively threatened and want to run away, and I've seen the projections of that, even to the point where people, even family, have attacked me on the internet because they're threatened by my, the yeah, development family. of my, yeah, mm -hmm. development of my consciousness, because mm -hmm. they're hugely threatened. So I, every time it comes up, I engage it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I identify it, I observe it with that engagement, and I dissolve it, I sit in it. Sometimes I'll go face to face with people and let's say, let's have a chat about this because mm -hmm. I've got the truth. Mm -hmm. And you will not be able to sit in the room with me if I've got the truth. Your argument will fall away because people have all, all sorts of weird things that they throw at you, but when they sit in the room with you, they don't exist. It's because they are projections of your ego, they're mm -hmm. projections of your perception, and they feel hugely threatened by consciousness. They're threatened of ego death, but the ego can't die. Everything just dissolves and realigns it just becomes a hierarchy so then the ego still has freedom 
but under authority. The sensual body and the physical body still have freedom, but under authority. So we have this beautiful hierarchy where we, everything we do then is working from a divine satnav, from a um, uh, uh, from consciousness, okay. or from the, what the, what Ken Wilber would call the authentic self. Mm. So all of the books are telling us the same thing, and they all sound kind of extreme and fantastical, but it's basically saying, as you grow, you, you know, you'll keep bumping into these things, because they're in you. You can't escape them. You can go and hide in a cave. You know, Lot, if you look at the story of Abraham and Lot, Lot listened to neurotic fear. He said he didn't see potential in anything. He didn't see God in anything. He ended up living in a cave, sleeping with his daughters, because he'd become so afraid of the world. He actually, his perception de destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Whereas, whereas Abraham went on to find progeny, wealth, and leadership just by seeing potential in everything, mm. but not without a struggle. You know, our prophets had the same problems. He would go to God and say, so where is it? Where's my progeny? Where's my wealth? Where's my leadership? My wife is 80. Sarah is 80. She is not going to be having children. And he says, you've got to, you've got to cultivate your imagination. You've got to see potential in everything. And his wife, in the story, in the metaphor, had a baby at the age of 82 or something. Okay. Um, and then he got leadership and he got wealth. But he, he had to do his part. Mm -hmm. He had to confront the things he was afraid of. He had to sit and cultivate his imagination. Again, we talked about Yakim earlier on. The truth is undeniably right in front of you. But, the level, but the, there are three levels to Yakim. One is the truth is there, but you need intellectual proof. Mm -hmm. Uh, second is that the, tr the truth is there, but you need to be able to visualise yourself in that truth. So Jeff Thompson can be a writer, but Jeff Thompson's different. So I, c I can't see myself as a writer, even though Jeff Thompson's a writer. So you have to start seeing yourself as a writer. Visualise yourself as a writer. Actually project it. You have to build the kingdom in cognition before it comes out there. And then the third level is when it realises, and you have the manifestation, and then the truth is undeniable. How can you deny it when it's in front of you? So, well, with my first book, I thought it was impossible to be published, a person like me. My perception was so strong, I ran away in terror from the idea. And if I mentioned it to people, they attacked me mm. and, and uh, you know, said I was pretentious. And so I collected intellectual proof of other people like me, from my background, very similar to me, who'd become published. So intellectually, it's possible. Yeah. But at that level, it was possible, but not for me. Then I started to practice seeing myself. Mm. I would lay the chapters out. I would see myself at a book signing. I'd bring all the emotions in. I'd, I'd mean very powerful, three-dimensional emotional imagination. Then suddenly it tipped, and I got a book published. And I went from one book to forty books. Mm. And of course, because I because I've challenged that truth, I'm challenging every truth. I become a playwright. I become a film writer. I become a BAFTA winner. Mm. I become an eighth dan in the martial arts. You know, I, I became a choreographer, in, I was a fight choreographer in a West End play. I'm directing the play now, I'm, I know anything's possible yeah, yeah. if I'm able to uh, overcome that sea of nescience. So when we say the truth is undeniably right in front of us, it is. But we still have, to, exactly what you said, we still have to access that. We still have to do, we have to take massive action to do that. Because changing perception is as difficult as changing addiction. You know, so the, the, the potential is there for everybody, but they've got to be prepared to go inside, not outside. We don't change the world at the level of the world. We change the world at the level of cognition. And cognition unequivocally can be changed. Jeff, we, we both have a passion for the martial arts, and I think the martial arts have, have influenced uh, a lot of what we have done yes, and, and do in our yeah. lives. Um, You've even met Chuck Norris. I know. <laughs> What's he like? Sat in Las Vegas, yeah. having tea with Chuck Norris, him yeah. talking to me about when he used to spar with Bruce Lee. It was yeah. very surreal. I'm thinking, how yeah. did I get here? <laughs> Regarding Bruce Lee, I just want to ask you something, one thing about Bruce Lee, which I find fascinating. In his film, End of the Dragon, hmm. when the New Zealand guy comes up to him, maybe he's a bit of a bully, and they're on the boat waiting to go to the island. Uh, he, the New Zealand guy asked him about his fighting style. 
And Bruce Lee says it's the art of fighting without fighting. Mm, yeah. Okay. I love the quote. What does that mean to you? It means that you get to the level of Budo, which is at the martial level, which is physical, managing the physical body, getting mastery over the physical body through technique, cleansing ourselves through masoji, through through the ritual of movement. We get we master the physical body, the sensual body, we master the mind body, then we fall into the spiritual realm, which is the Budo. We fall into Budo. And at that level the the fight is no longer external, it's internal. So that's all then about expanding consciousness. So at the level of expanded consciousness, threat can't exist in your reality. Mm -hmm. So um, somebody like uh, Ushiba, for instance, who was the founder of Aikido, uh, he was a very physical man, went in some, had some life and death battles. Um, when they interviewed him later on, when he'd found, he, he trained with Anissa Bura Debuchi, who was a great spiritual prophet over there, to develop the Budo. When he was, um, when someone asked him later in his life, do you worry about physical threat? He just laughed. He said, no. He said, if people came to take me on, he said they would realize straight away that they're taking on the whole universe. <laughs> so it's a very real, um, very real frequency where threat can't exist. Mm. So he's so confident in his own ability that he doesn't need to be physical. Mm. That's that, but you only get, you you only get that good if you go into the arts, um, in in the, in a true sense. So we got to learn we've got to learn how to kill with the arts, which is an uncomfortable word to say. But most people in the martial arts flirt around the martial arts, so they don't actually go into the actual ability to be martial to kill. Mm. Once we've got that ability to kill and we know how to kill, we no longer want to kill because we realise that in killing somebody else, mm. we kill ourselves. So at that level of rehumanizing people and taking the poetry away from violence, we're able to transcend it. We're so confident in what we do that it's quite easy to let people off because we think they don't know what they're coming into. They don't know what they're stepping into. Mm -hmm. Especially when you go into things like judo, um, where, where there's strangulation and stuff like that, where you can kill somebody in 30 seconds just with strangulation, okay. just with a choke. And you get that ability to control people in a very physical way against their will. You've knocked out lots of people in real encounters. You know how potent it is and you know it works in any language. The moment you start being very, get to that, the peak of the physical stuff, um, you no longer see enemies anymore. You don't see enemies. This is what happened to me. I didn't see enemies. I saw somebody's daddy. I saw somebody's son. I saw somebody's brother. I saw somebody's husband. I saw it in very real terms. I knock a guy out and he's an enemy. He's on the floor and he's bleeding and he's pissed himself and his wife comes running over and she's screaming and crying and hysterical. You cannot not see a human being and you're repelled. Every cell in my body was filled with anguish. Um, uh, was it, was it, um, was it Napoleon? There's nothing like the sight of the, the, the battlefield after the fight to inspire princes with a love of peace and a horror of war. Yeah. Sometimes you have to see it then you go, I don't want to knock out somebody's daddy. I don't want to knock out somebody's brother or somebody's husband. So you develop your skills so that they're so potent, they're so good, that you can be gentle. You don't need to use them, you can just dismiss them, because you know how to do that. So that's what the art of fighting without fighting is. At a basic level, fighting without fighting is just about avoidance, escape, mm -hmm. verbal dissuasion, loopholing, posturing, anything to avoid a physical yeah. encounter. Mostly it's just about awareness, we know, you know, was it, was it James Coburn said, um, avoid arseholes and, and, and rough places and don't be an arsehole and, you know, don't be a rough place yourself or something right, like that. Yeah, yeah. It basically just said, we, we know where the trouble is. Don't go there. Don't be in those places. Put yourself in a different frequency. So uh, if I go into a pub and I have a pint and uh, someone starts staring at me across the bar and I know there's going to be threat, I'll put the pint down and go somewhere else. There's yeah. 50 pubs in the same street. Yeah, yeah. I had a fifth hand friend that said to me, I've got this guy in the pub, every time I go in he stares at me and he's aggressive with me. Uh, and I says, well, go to another pub. I said, you know that pub, you know its right. reputation. When you go in there, that's what you're going to get. He says, yeah, but I should be able to stay there. And I said, well, you know, there's a piece of dog shit on the floor. You should be able to stand in it. But that doesn't mean that you should. That, <laughs> doesn't, that doesn't mean you will. Yes. I said, you know, just don't go to those places. If you want to practice advanced technique, why don't you just go and speak to him and say, how are you? Yes. I've seen you before. I think I know your brother. Mm -hmm communicate with him, you know, shock him, yeah. you know, but so, so it's, uh, it's, it's mostly just about 
Um, you know, someone said to me once, uh, I did a self-defence class, so I feel much more confident now about walking down dark entries and across fields at night. And you, and you know straight away that they haven't done a, self def a real self-defence class. Because they real, wouldn't be going there in the first place. A real self-defence yeah. class would say avoid that because you're vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a jungle. Jeff, it's been brilliant talking with you and, and a million thanks for, for, for sharing some of your insights, some of your ideas, some of your philosophy on life. Um, if people want to find out more about you, do you, do you have a website? Yeah, jeffthompson.com. Jeffthompson.com. That's Jeff with a G, Thompson with a P. But if you put Jeff Thompson into the into Google, it comes up straight away anyway. Yeah. And we've got um, there's three sites there: jeffthompson.com, Jeff Thompson Inspired, Jeff Thompson Writer. There's about 150 free articles on there. Okay. There's about 60 or 70 free videos, so people can go on there and feast. Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. This is Andy Hickson from Bully Box TV signing off. Join us next time. Thank you.